Hello and thanks for stopping by. This is Impossible Mission 2 for the NES. Now this was an unlicensed Nintendo cartridge that was originally an Epics game, and it was ported and released in 1989 by Nova Trade, an American video entertainment. It's a franchise released originally for the Commodore 64. There was no Impossible Mission 1 for the NES, only Part 2, and it's unlicensed, so it physically looks different. It's black with a slightly different shape to it, and it feels thinner, actually. In this game, you play a super spy running through the base of a supervillain. The villain's name is Dr. Adam Bender. Your goal is to try to turn off a missile system and save the world. To do this, you have to do a bunch of things. First, you have to survive puzzle rooms. You have to navigate through the towers, access the central control room, and then turn off the correct computer, all within a time limit. You have unlimited lives in this game. But every time you die, time comes off your meter, I think, I think five minutes. Also, you have no weapons. You have no gun to fire, only your wits and a front flip. This base is arranged in a series of eight towers, and they all surround a central tower. Towers are separated by elevators and hallways, and in the hallways there are no villains or obstacles, so this is where you're safe. You can travel to different rooms this way, you can go up and down, hit rooms from behind, that sort of a deal. And this is also where you access your personal computer. This is where you can see a map of the base, and you can manipulate codes you might have. You start out on the first tower, and all you can really do is travel up and down in an elevator, or run down a hallway and go up and down the elevator on the other side. With this elevator, or elevators, you can access various rooms. This game is all about going into these rooms. Here you're going to find robots that can kill you, and you find all these items that you can search. You need to search this stuff to find various codes that you need to progress. You search pretty much every item in the room you can find. All you're doing is looking for codes and programs. You just have to stand in front of an item and press up and you'll see a search meter. You can stop searching midstream if you need to run away, but after the search bar finally finishes, you may or may not find something. Then you run off to search the next thing. Luckily, when you search something in this game, it will disappear from the screen. I can only imagine how difficult this game would be if you had to also remember what you searched in a room. It would be crazy. Now you might find part of a code which would just be one color number, but you might also find various programs that you store and you can perform functions in the rooms. Now these programs, they're just symbols, and you trigger them at the computer terminals in each room. You can use these symbols to turn lights on in a tower, you can freeze all the robots for 17 seconds. You can reset left-right moving platforms or up and down platforms. You can also select mines and bombs. Now, there's nothing saying that you have to complete an entire room. You can step into a room and step right back out if you want. That's probably useful if the room's pitch black, in which case you should go to another room in that tower and turn on the lights. Sometimes, actually, you're forced to leave and come back to some rooms later. Certain things are going to be accessible from the left of the screen. Some things might only be accessible from the right, or maybe by coming from the top if there's an elevator. The thing is, each room is generally different, and you just need to figure out the best way to proceed through a level to search as much as you can. Sometimes you can't search everything, and that's okay. Okay, pin codes. In order to go from tower to tower, you need to find colored pin codes, and you're going to find the individual numbers as you search things. You're going to get one number at a time, and it's going to have some sort of a color. You're going to use these in your computer to figure out the three-digit code that you need to advance. It's basically a simple combination lock. Now, you might find a whole bunch of numbers in a tower, but only three of them are correct. To make a combination, you need to have one blue, one yellow, and one green number. You just test them in your computer when you're in a hallway. Also, if you search enough of a tower to get the PIN number, and you open up whatever safes are available. There's nothing saying you have to go and open everything else that's available in that tower. You might just want to move on to the next tower. You are on a timer. Now you can die by running into robots in the various rooms, or you can fall to your death. You're going to have a wonderfully horrible scream if you fall. It's kind of great. It's not unusual to try to flip onto a platform and just miss. Happens all the time. So this game is about you figuring out how to navigate all these rooms using the platforms, figuring out the timing, and using your front flip the best you can to avoid the robots, or jump over gaps. You press the A button to perform your flip, 
and you're going to really need to get used to the distance that you actually flip because it's exact. Timing is going to be important if you're trying to get over moving robots, and it's a mechanic that you really have to just learn. Jumping too, it's probably easier if you're stationary if you need to time your jumps to move over a gap. Running and jumping on the move gets me killed a lot. It's just less exact. Sometimes you have to, but overall, standing still is going to make an easier jump for you. Now in some rooms you're going to see a safe, and this is where the musical keys are. You need to blow open a safe using a bomb, and then you need to record the music that's inside. Later you're going to use these to assemble a musical tune, and you use that tune to get into the main control room. So this game is heavily based on timing, and strong analysis of the rooms as they appear to you. There's a good way to get through rooms, usually, but you really need to figure out the best flow and the timing to make it through, and it's not easy. Most games, you expect a progression of difficulty after you start. You expect it's going to be a little easier at the beginning, and as you get deeper into the game, it gets more complex, but here I do not get that feeling. This game is tough from the get-go. You're going to die a lot trying to figure this one out for sure. I mean, just learning how to make jumps. That takes a ton of time, and it takes a while to gather enough pieces of the code to actually assemble one. When I finally accessed a second tower, after fumbling with that computer for a while, that's when the game started to make more sense. It took some doing. This is also the type of game where you really need to save, but this is only useful if you're playing on a machine that has save states. If you have one, use it. That makes the game worth playing. But also, here's where things get more interesting with this game. First, there are basically two modes in the game. When you're in a room, you're in what's called action mode. And when you're in a hallway, you're what's in called what's called computer mode. This is where you get to use your personal computer. Okay, we'll start with that explanation. So, backing up a little bit, I have the NES manual. I ordered it specifically to help make this game less confusing, and I'm staring at the control layout printed in the manual, and it's wrong. Check this out. Looking at action mode, this says B button is jump. Well, it's not. A button is jump. It also says you plant bombs with the B button, which you don't. You have to select a bomb from the computer terminal, and then you press down in A to set a bomb. Now, getting these two buttons wrong in action mode, I guess that's minor, and it's maybe a little funny, but what isn't funny is the select button. This image says the select button is not used, and it's not used unless you're in computer mode in the hallway. Then it shows you the hidden save menu item that they ignored in the manual and never properly implemented. This menu boasts the ability to restart the game and save the game. What? This wasn't mentioned once in the manual. First, in this menu, let's look at the restart. This will restart the game, but for some reason it might put you on a different tower. I don't know why. And I don't know if this means it's forwarding you through the game at all. I don't think it is, because you would still need to get all the music codes from the other towers to get to the end. Every time I restart my machine, I start in Tower 1. But, if I start the game and then I use this function, I can start in another tower. You get to see different rooms. It was so strange. Now as for the save game, you can save your game, but it's not permanent. It saves the game as long as you don't turn off the console, which is only usable, I guess, if you plan to beat the game today, and you want to dedicate like an entire day to beating a game. Or maybe if you don't mind leaving your system on forever, I guess. It's kind of usable as a save, but it's definitely not practical. Maybe that's why it's not mentioned in the manual. All I can guess is either it wasn't fully implemented or somebody that was writing the manual didn't realize it existed. Who knows? I also cracked open the cartridge. I thought maybe there was a dead battery inside. I mean, it is a 40-year-old cartridge. They used to have batteries on some of these boards that would save the information. But I opened it up and there's no spot for a battery in there. It just looks like they might have built the menu and either they never fully finished it or they forgot to write about it. I don't know. In either case, it caught me off guard when I accidentally found it. So if you have states available to you on your console, that's going to be how you get through this game. With save states, this game becomes very doable. Not a problem. Once again, this isn't an easy game. 
Now, if you look on YouTube as of the making of this video, I cannot find one long play for this NES version, probably because the save states were not implemented. I see most people picking up this game and putting it right back down after getting frustrated after 20 minutes. Like I said, if you have save states, this game becomes very playable. Now, the Impossible Mission games are known for having really smooth animations, particularly when you're running around or flipping forward. It's considered similar to Prince of Persia, actually, because way back in the day when those games started to come out, the franchise had these really smooth sprite animations for your character running around. It was great. I mean, the animations here are nice. I just, I'm not sure if they're better than the Commodore 64 version that they were based on. Now, Impossible Mission 1 and 2, these were considered some of the best games for the Commodore 64, and this version, although it certainly loads faster on the NES than the Commodore 64, I don't think it looks any better. I mean, I guess it's in the same range. It just doesn't feel better. The colors here are certainly locked to the NES palette of that era. The colors are kind of strangely chosen, and they're really vibrant. Possibly more vibrant than you'd expect in some cases. The opening screen is nice, and the music is nice at the open too, but there's no music as you actually play the game. That's probably best, actually because the game is already pretty intense when you're playing through a level. I'm not sure if music would improve or make it more difficult. One more fun fact as I was perusing this manual. Here's another screenshot. At the end of the manual, they dedicate an entire page for people with a newer revision of the NES console that can't play this game. They ask if you bought the Nintendo system after 1990. They mentioned that you might have a deck that was secretly modified by Nintendo to prevent you from enjoying this game. They also give you some options. One, they will mail you the repair instructions for you to bring your console to a TV repairman. And they'll give you a letter that you can mail to Nintendo to ask them for a refund to repair your machine. They mention Nintendo has no obligation to refund you but that American Video Entertainment believes they're morally obligated to do so. Okay. You can also mail your console to the company, and they'll modify the system for you, or the third option, you can call their hotline, I'm guessing, to complain, and at this stage I'm pretty sure the number's been discontinued. It's just wild to see this in a manual. It's like they're accusing Nintendo of being underhanded. Hey, I look at it, the NES was Nintendo's property, they can do with it whatever they want. The fact that they required companies to license through Nintendo, that was their business model, like it or leave it. It's just amazing to me that a company would provide you a letter to send to Nintendo to ask them for a repair refund. That's just wild to me. So overall, this is a hard game to get into. It's just rough at the get-go. But if you can use safe states, this game becomes much more accessible. And after you've unlocked your first tower, it becomes even possible that you could finish this game. I'm really bummed they didn't flesh out this save menu, or at least mention it. That's weird. I mean, yes, you lose the save after you restart your console, but just being able to save it temporarily, I think that would definitely help some players, especially the ones willing to dedicate a large block of time to try to beat this one. Well, that's all I have for Impossible Mission 2 for the NES. Thanks for giving this one a look, and I'll catch you on another video.